स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया today's lecture is all about intertextuality intertextuality is a term coined by julia kristeva we will be, will be looking at the key theoret theoreticians of intertextuality soon so the idea of any work uh, of intertextuality is that a text is not produced in a vacuum okay do, just doesn't arise out of thin air so whether it's a film or a literary text you are talking about there is always a connection hmm? so uh, a text because we are talking about cinematic text uh, cinematic text emerged from a cinematic tradition there is a tradition of cinema and we have been talking a lot about semiotics as well so we know what a certain close up uh, means for example when you look at a certain close up of uh, the heroine here ingrid bergman from casablanca what does it suggest what kind of a look is that unless you know the grammar of cinema you wouldn't know mm, so that look suggests love and longing for a lost uh, beloved hmm? when you look at uh, uh, humphrey bogart's close up you know that there are certain emotions and therefore we this is what we call understanding cinematic grammar and traditions so cinema cinematic texts emerge from a certain kind of a tradition films are produced within a social context of course unless and until we know the socio cultural backdrop or ba background of a particular story we wouldn't understand what the film is all about so to understand a movie like casablanca what are we supposed to understand uh, where is the setting in the town of casablanca hmm? and what what's the period all about <laughs> nazi occupation okay we are talking about uh, um, uh, you know germany taking over control of europe certain parts of europe okay so unless you understand the uh, socio cultural political context it would be very difficult to understand why casablanca is such a great love story otherwise we wouldn't know the understand the climax at all so um uh, while talking about intertextuality we are told that filmmakers entail a careful assembling or putting together of pre existing elements cinema is putting together of pre existing elements we'll talk about that and therefore filmmakers draw on old myths character types we were talking about types of characters if you remember hmm? and narrative conventions most of you by now are i'm sure familiar with myths and plots and narrative conventions in cinema um often filmmaking is compared to an assembling together of disjointed elements bringing together disjoint see movies are never made in a linear fashion they shoot perhaps the climax first and the beginning last okay so it's and then putting together of all those things but cinema also draws on from various other sources something from politics something from cultural tradition something from old myths okay remember we were have been talking about um, a hero with a thousand faces old myths remember joseph campbell's narrative movie so idea of narrative so old myths are often dr uh, drawn upon so uh, it's often said in a lighter vein that filmmakers are like dr frankenstein the scientist who created a a kind of a monster okay and he created that monster uh, a new body from existing parts of old dead bodies and that's what cinema is all about i know the uh, simile is quite macabre but that's the way it is each movie is a patchwork of tissue taken from other texts you know bringing together various disjointed elements and knowledge of these parts are as desirable as understanding the whole so relationship between part and the whole 
Okay. Intertextuality very simply put means shaping of one text by other texts, how a work of art is influenced by other artistic traditions. So, how one uh, think Tarantino, you do watch film cinema of Quentin Tarantino, right? And people have gone and written books about uh, the way Tarantino borrows from other sources. Okay, so, shaping of one text by other texts. I mean, if uh, you can always go back and look at Kill Bill, I think that is one of his better films. And when you think of Kill Bill, you will find how it is shaped by several texts. I will be giving you an, that kind of an exercise in a moment. Okay, you have to do that. Ask yourself, uh, how many of you have not seen Kill Bill? Everyone? Almost everyone. So, yeah, the, the movie is very accessible. So, we will talk about it. So, uh, uh, the term was coined by Julia Kristeva and I quote her, the meaning we find in a text is not to be located in its relationship to the mind in which it seems to have originated, but in its relationship to other texts. That is what she understand or she uh, uh, means by intertextuality. So, if texts are produced by texts, then films are produced by other films. What do you understand by that? Let us talk about Kill Bill now. Take half a minute, take 30 seconds. Tell me how many texts have gone into making of Kill Bill. Not just the screenplay by Tarantino or whoever, but how Kill Bill is influenced by other cinematic texts. Quickly put down, jot down notes. Watch it, Kill Bill, part 1, part 2. You can work in pairs, you can sit with them if you want. Okay, quick responses. Shaping of the text of Kill Bill by other texts. There is a scene of animation in that movie. Wonderful. Uh, it is like complete violence, so he uh, wanted to put that movie scene in animation. He once in an interview, he said this, uh, this scene is inspired from a Tamil movie, Alavanda, which came uh, a year before Kill Bill. Hmm. Okay, so anime inspired by Alavandan. So, how and we also talk about the Japanese anime, mm. right. So, how many texts have gone into shaping that particular scene? Anything else in Kill Bill? Thank you. Anything else? The chapter wise uh, narrative. 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 Yeah. Is it an inspiration from other film? Do you remember no. anything else? Perhaps, yeah. perhaps, you know one of the French masters of the French new wave period have done it before. Uh, uh, so, anything else? The costume. It is a? It is a homage to Bruce Lee. The yellow uh, costume with black stripe. Yeah, that is a homage to one of the films in which Bruce Lee starred. Game of the Game of the Okay. Okay. So, there is a direct quotation, that is a direct homage. It also touches on many Chinese myths, uh, like the art of fighting. And the sword making, mm -hmm. sword fighting, yes. So, chi ancient drawing on from Chinese myths that we were talking about, old myths are evoked. Martial art movies, yes, definitely uh, they are quoted throughout the film. And also in part 2, the western. Okay. Spaghetti Western. Even at the end of part one, the showdown between Lucy Liu and hmm? Yeah, it is more of a martial arts 
referencing then a western but then in part 2 michael madsen part when she goes in search of uh, yeah yeah one of her enemies and he shoots her in the heart and buries her alive okay so that uh, again is a homage to several of the b films okay exploitation movies of uh, the 60s and the 70s and of course um, the music is a direct quotation from one of those um, Ennio Morricone and Sergio Leone combination films. Okay, so, now we understand how text begin begets text and movies be, beget movies. So, um, uh, there is another theoretician Mikhail Bakhtin, we have been talking about him for quite a while. 1895 to 1975, a Russian critic who said, and this is how Julia Kristeva gets her theory of intertextuality. According to Bakhtin, all human communication are dialogic and heteroglossic. Now, dialogic is speaking, having a dialogue with each other, right? And how many people do you need to have a dialogue with? At least two, at least two. Okay. Heteroglossic, many tongues, many tongues. So, uh, um, human beings have a kind of a, a, a flow of communication and that communication involves dialogue and involving many tongues, okay, many languages. It does not necessarily mean that you should have knowledge of many languages. What it means is that there are always several points of view, several perspectives okay, and that is what uh, intertextuality, uh, that is where intertextuality come from. Okay. So, every utterance is a continue or a contribution to an ongoing dialogue, we will be seeing that soon and every word reflects what has gone before. So, that takes us back to our original premise that films are not created in a vacuum. Okay, there is always a reference to something that has been done or said before. Like you pointed out, the anim scene is a reference to Alavandan. Okay. So, Kristeva says, any text is constructed of a mosaic of quotation, quotations, any text is the absorption and transformation of another. A text quotes and cites from another text and then gets a life of its own. Ask me any question. It just means very simplistically put that no work of art can claim to be entirely original. Okay. There is always an influence uh, consciously or subconsciously. We are not talking about uh, shameless plagiarism now. <laughs> okay, so, do not get confused with that. I will answer your question on plagiarism also. How how do uh, how does cinema get dialogic now films refer to other films and other texts at a conscious or subconscious level films are often read in the light of their resemblance to other films and texts films tap into a shared cultural heritage. You need to understand something, a, a movie like Casablanca for example, speaks a universal language of uh, a love triangle. You watch the uh, climax of Casablanca, right? And it is a love triangle. How do you know that this is a love triangle? Yes? between the lovers and uh, someone makes a sacrifice, two men, a husband and uh, a jilted lover and at the end the lover making the supreme sacrifice for the woman. Okay. So, we know and this is a theme that can be understood anywhere, yeah, because the uh, love triangle is a universally uh, understandable phenomenon. So, therefore, films should tap or most films tap into a shared cultural heritage. Otherwise, they become something else, you know, they would not be universally popular. Okay. 
films feed on pre existing materials and expressive forms. Ex by expressive forms, we mean painting, drama, theatre, performance, uh, performing art, uh, even music. Hmm? So, intertextuality is not exactly plagiarism, but quotation. Now, what is the, uh, what's the difference between, let us assume you are writing an assignment and you are told no, do not plagiarize and you are quoting. However, how, so how is it different from plagiarizing? When you quote, you are crediting, crediting someone. When you plagiarize, <coughs> yeah, so quotation is very direct. In cinema, Tarantino cannot refer to something and tell you or come forward and tell you, look, this is a scene from Sergio Leonis, that cannot happen. But it is done so, in such a way that you know he is uh, paying a homage, there is no attempt to camouflage. Okay. In plagiarism, people make an effort to camouflage. Okay. So, that is how you understand cinematic plagiarism, quite different from literary plagiarism. So, intertextuality and Casablanca, another key theoretician is Umberto Eco, the Italian critic, who has worked extensively on intertextuality and written essays uh, on the film. One of his foremost essays is Casablanca, Cult Movies and Intertextual Collage, 1984, where I quote him, Casablanca is not just one film, it is many films and anthology. Are you familiar with the name Umberto Eco? The name of the rose, not black rose, name of the rose. Okay. He is a key semiotician also. Casablanca, and now we will come uh, to the film, talk about it. It was made in 1942, directed by Michael Curtis, starring Humphrey Bogart and a young Ingrid Bergman. And uh, the movie begins with a close up, you know the title of the movie is written across a close up of what? A map of Africa, okay. that means the movie is set in Africa, we are told at the beginning. So, references to countries, geographies and it is set to the theme of Marseille. Okay. So, uh, we are told perhaps that in at certain level, it is a patriotic film. The film was based on an unpublished, unknown, unappreciated play called Everybody Comes to Rick's. Rick is our hero, played by Humphrey Bogart. He runs a what does he run? A bar, okay. A bar which has a pianist playing a sad tune on his piano throughout the movie. So it's a it's a bar, okay. It's a very popular bar, and uh, he is the kind of man uh, who is uh, uh, always brooding. And later on, we know why he is brooding because he has lost the woman he loves, and we are told the story in flashback. One day, it so happens that the woman he has loved and lost in Paris, she walks in, in the bar okay, and uh, she recognizes the trusted friend, the pianist, okay, who used to be always around Rick, as played by Humphrey Bogart. And um, he looks at her and stops playing. And therefore, comes Ingrid Bergman's famous lines, play it Sam. Casablanca is a story, love triangle in the time of second world war. So, love triangle between a cynical lover, a beautiful girl and her husband. So, um, this it comes to a point where we know that he is going to get arrested and though that is the scene that we just watched. 
the movie ends how Rick helps Ilsa and her husband escape Casablanca and the Nazi police and we know and how he does it. Okay. He kills, he bribes, he threatens people, but ensures that the girl leaves the country safely on that flight with her husband. And of course, it ends with a, with a couple of famous lines, you know Casablanca is full of uh, memorable lines. Here is looking at you kid, play it Sam and let us round up the usual suspects and you know what that type, what that line has led to. Okay. What is that? The title of a movie, The Usual Suspects. Okay. So, um, Umberto Eco gives us a list of archetypes in Casablanca. You, you, if you may just recall, we did something uh, uh, called narrative a few weeks back and we were talking about Vladimir Prop, who gives us morphology of, of uh, folk tales in which he has given us seven kind of uh, characters, archetypic, archetypal uh, type characters, um, the hero, the false hero, the villain, the damsel in distress, etcetera. Umberto Eco's list of archetypes in Casablanca, one is how the music is set or you put to use. The magic key, okay, another element of folk tales, but this this we are having Umberto Eco's list, okay, not Vladimir Props. And here it's the visa that opens the door. The magic horse, that's the airplane. And if you remember, even the aircraft has the figure of a horse on it. The charming scoundrels, okay. So that's the police officer, the prefect, as played by uh, in the movie, who is called Renault. The desperate lover, another archetype, the uncontaminated hero, that is husband, because uh, the desperate hero is contaminated. The faithful servant and his master, Sam and Rick, the pianist and Rick, the damsel in white and in movie, you, in the movie you will find most of the time she is dressed in white, you know, signifying uh, everything that is good with the world in a morally ambivalent society. The villains obviously are the Nazis and the police and therefore, Umberto Eco feels Casablanca is not one movie, but many movies, several movies. So, remember what he says at the beginning, we were talking about it is an anthology. Several movies are going on when we read Casablanca. So, Casablanca, uh, for Casablanca, Umberto Eco says, two cliches make us laugh, I quote him, a hundred cliches move us, for we sense dimly that the cliches are talking among themselves and celebrating a reunion. An intertextual archetype is a topos or standard situation that manages to be particularly appealing to a given cultural area or a historical period. Think about this, okay. an intertextual archetype is a topos or a standard situation that manages to be particularly appealing to a given cultural area or a historical period. Now, why is Casablanca appealing in the light of this quotation? Was the cultural area, was the historical period, the appeal of Casablanca? Well, you see when he, the director is playing on uh, the theme of patriotism, love triangle, okay, these are culturally shared beliefs or topos, standard situations. Okay, and therefore, there is a mean and then you also have a particular historical period which is understood by most of us. Okay, so, therefore, the beauty of Casablanca. Hmm? Is there anyone? Anyway, hmm? we can relate a love triangle to World War II. But the movie which is a love triangle is set during the second world war. 
Okay. So, we may not exactly be able to relate, but then we know that this is a story and the fate of the lovers gets influenced, impacted because of the political situation, right? is not that what we are told in Casablanca, but for the war they would have been together. Okay, but it is very important that Victor Lazlo husband has to live on, because uh, for the country he is more important than Rick. Okay, and if Victor has to live on, then he has to leave that place along with his wife, otherwise without his wife his work would never be, because she is with her love she sustains him. Okay, so, it is important that she should be with him, therefore we need to have our hero making that sacrifice. Okay. So, love is secondary, country is the most important, that is as therefore, do, did I answer your question, Why, how is the second world war related to love triangle. Any questions on Casablanca, then we can move on. So, Casablanca is referred to in uh, another movie called Brazil by Terry yeah, Terry Gilliam. Okay, uh, so, the bureaucrats secretly watch Casablanca and crave for action and romance in their controlled lives. So, Casablanca is evoked at some point, although um, what genre of movie is Brazil? Science fiction, Science fiction black comedy, dystopian. dystopian. Yeah, dystopian. Uh, and, but uh, you find the bureaucrats watching, the people they are watching Casablanca. And again, Humphrey Bogart character, the Sam character makes an appearance in Woody Allen's play it again, Sam. So, directed by Herbert Ross. So, again referring or referencing the film. Okay, um, intertextuality and the western. So, we are going to talk about two western texts and how intertextuality and not just a remake comes into the picture. So, there is a theme in the western genre, a lone stranger comes into a town that has two gangs or families that are at war, which movie we are talking about? Yes. The good, the bad, not really. I remember another movie which you made us watch in the previous course, it is called Sukiyaki Western Django, which is exactly the same movie, but that is mm, a reference yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, Western Django, which uh, Tarantino has uh, redone. Okay. So, this lone stranger wants to play both sides, okay, to make us, to make as much money as possible, but ends up in getting in trouble with both these warring gangs. Does it ring a bell? Exactly. Kurosawa's Japanese film Yojimbo. So, I am talking about Kurosawa's Yojimbo and then another famous film based on the same theme, Last Man Standing, starring Bruce Willis. It is a wonderful movie, terribly entertaining. Watch it and watch it alongside Yojimbo. Okay. Clint Eastwood's A Fistful of Dollars, not the good, the bad. But a fistful of dollars again deals with the same theme. Okay. Uh, if you look at a movie like Star Wars, Star Wars theme, as we were talking about when we discussed the idea of narrative okay, and how myths influence narratives, we talked about uh, Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces and how Star Wars follows the same trajectory. So, hero's universal spiritual journey and then hero's journey is a common theme in many films and we have already discussed this with reference to the Terminator, Lord of the Rings and several others. You can take more examples, okay, for example, Indian, Indiana Jones, which again follows the same theme. Hero's initiation, his journey, his adventures, his temptations a damsel in distress, a false hero okay, and you will find. So, again we are talking about intertextuality, even a light hearted movie like Kung Fu Panda, okay, you can find several quotations taken from all these films. 
and they are not plagiarizing. They know that we know what they are talking about. Again the same idea of hero's journey and initiation, quest for truth, all these motives are found in, even in films like Avatar and the silence of the lambs, very different by way of genre, but thematically quite similar. So, uh, now we come to the uh, idea of cult films. Again I quote Umberto Eco, uh, he feels that in order to transform a work into a cult object, one must be able to break, dislocate, unhinge it so that one can remember only parts of it irrespective of their original relationship with the whole. How many of you have watched Reservoir Dogs? Okay. Is it a cult? Okay. What is a cult? And what is a popular movie? What is a cult? Only a dedicated following of… Cult has a dedicated set of followers, fan following. Hmm? Um, give me some examples. The Big Lebowski. The Big Lebowski. Dazed and confused. Dazed and confused, okay. Fight Club. Pulp Fiction. Fight Club. Fight Club, Pulp Fiction. Hmm? So, they are cult films. Remember, cult films are not extremely successful or very popular. Uh, uh, what I mean is, they are extremely popular among a group of people. There are people who write about them, discuss them, etcetera, but they were not huge mega hits. So, Shole is not a cult film, right? It is a universally popular movie. Again, it is if you look at if you watch Shole, you will find several elements of intertextuality. I mean, that is a good exercise to understand. Shole is such a popular film, okay? And if you watch it, you will find several intertextual elements occurring, uh, existing simultaneously. So, an unhinged film should display not one central idea, but many. It should not reveal a coherent philosophy of composition, that is the idea of a cult film. Now, uh, do you think Reservoir Dogs or Fight Club or Pulp Fiction, they subscribe to this definition? No central philosophy, but several things going on. Yes or no? Yes, yes. that is the idea of a cult. So, cult is a term which is used uh, very loosely often, but uh, according to Umberto Eco, um, Umberto Eco, there is a definition okay, and cult movie should subscribe to certain uh, parameters. So, Donnie Darko is a cult movie. Okay, you would not find a mass following for the film, but whoever has watched it, okay, they are dedicated to it. Fight Club is a cult movie. It was not a pop successful movie at all when it was released. I think Roger Ebert gave it? No. Half star. <laughs> okay. The ho Rocky Horror Picture Show, another good example of cult film. So, what is cult then? Again, I am borrowing from Umberto Eco's definitions. Cult movies have a world that fans and enthusiasts can explore. Everyone has a take on cult movies. Are you aware of this uh, 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 concept called fanfic? Okay. Fanfic. Cults usually have, we are talking about fans fanfic, fandom. So, what is fanfic? Fans start contributing to the plot, to the narrative. Okay, this is the way Harry Potter should proceed from now on onwards and because of the proliferation of the social network media, okay, anyone can rewrite and reinterpret Harry Potter the way they want to. Okay, so, that is what fans creating their own fiction, therefore fanfic, a support monitor. So, um, cults borrow from other films and texts, yes they do, Reservoir Dogs, Brazil, they all do that. Cults have limited, 
but very special appeal, ask the followers and they can die for it. Some features of cult films are like, they are usually strange, donny, uh, darko, quirky, offbeat, eccentric, surreal with outrages, weird, unique, cartoony characters or plots and garish sets. I would say most of Quentin Tarantino movies would fall into the cult category. I mean, think Kill Bill, full of cartoonish characters, right? So, uh, cults are often considered controversial because they step outside standard narrative and technical conventions. As you were just mentioning, an anime emerges from nowhere. Okay, a western genre comes out of the blue. Okay, so they play around with technical and genre conventions. And of course, they are very stylized and often flawed. Some famous cult directors, John Waters, Ed Wood, on whom Tim Burton made a movie, Ed Wood, Tarantino, the Coen brothers, someone just mentioned the big Lebowski. Jim Jarmusch, if you watch his uh, Johnny Depp movie, Dead Men, then you will understand how cult he is and full of intertextuality. David Lynch. Any questions here, so far, before we go on to discuss some other films? Any comments on cult? Why is it a cult? Just controversy, yes, but then you have to. Yes, sir, Ajit. It, uh, it was controversial, yes, but it was also sort of amazing. It was nominated for the Oscars as well that year. Well, that does, I mean, even Pulp Fiction. No, but the only difference with the clockwork orange was it was banned in several countries because of the violence and all. <laughs> you know what happens when films get banned. <laughs> Look at our recent example. <laughs> so, it is always good publicity, no? even if you are not interested in that film initially. Yeah. So, banning of films is not such a bad idea after all. Okay. Even if it is banned initially, it is always good publicity. So, uh, that does not. So, carry on. Yes, you were saying? Okay, so Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, 1982, starring a very young Harrison Ford, is a, another example of intertextual text based on Philip K. Dick's very eccentrically <laughs> titled novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The uh, the book makes a reference to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. We have already seen that, what it was all about. Blade Runner is often seen as a postmodern classic. We will soon be doing modernism in cinema and postmodernism in cinema. And why is Blade Runner a very good example of postmodernism? So, it quotes, alludes to, and references to other texts, and also the way it represents. Spatial, spatiality and temporality. What is the space of Blade Runner? Space. Yeah, where is it uh, set? Future world. In future. the future. Okay, so we are, and what is the time? Again, we are not very clear, somewhere in the future. The opening sequence begins with a close up of uh, an anonymous eye. We do not know whose eyes, eye is, it is. And it has uh, references to Dante's Inferno, Divine Comedy. And there are three parts to Dante's Inferno, uh, Divine Comedy, and one part is Inferno. So, you, you know, all these images of fire and destruction in that eye, all these are reflected in the eye. So, eye is a recurrent motif in the film. 
you also have a character of the eye maker, someone who makes eyes. Have you watched the movie? Okay, good. Eyes are seen as a window to the soul and then an eye watching over you throughout them. You know, the big brother is watching you, that kind of a sense. It was not an instant commercial success, most cults are not. They are not instantly commercially successful, but it has a faithful group of and very loyal group of followers. How many of you actually like Blade Runner? Okay, you like, okay, good. Again, uh, people have read images of LA, as I said, I, although it is not very clear, clearly mentioned which city it is set in, but then people were by the way, by the look of the uh, uh, imaginary town, we are told that this could be possibly LA. And then, uh, uh, it is uh, set in 2019, at some point we are told that, thus, that the period is 2019 and therefore, Blade Runner had a very strong influence on subsequent futuristic films, Matrix for example. There is a constant image of a, uh, of a very weird kind of a city in Blade Runner and f full of what? Advertisements, commercials, okay. people you know all these um, uh, hyperlinked stories telling you what to eat, what to think, what to wear. Okay. Every, uh, so, you, you are talking about a society where you are surrounded with commercialism. Okay. The city extremely dystopic, unclear, unstable. And uh, we will be discussing the Blade Runner soon, I want you to watch it, we have a uh, long weekend. So, watch the movie and on Monday we will be continuing the discussion of the film okay, as an intertextual text. So, um, three aspects of Blade Runner that you should be talking about or thinking of, one is the city speak, the language in the city, okay, there is a thing called city speak the kind of language the characters speak. The Tyrell Corporation, what does it stand for? And then what is the meaning of the replicant? You know what are replicants in the movie, but watch it all over again and you will understand. So, uh, the original screenwriter, although based on uh, someone else's uh, work, but uh, um, Hampton Fancher was the screenwriter who said, Blade Runner was always meant to be cautionary. For instance, the film was shot during the period of President Reagan and the cruel politics portrayed in the film were my rebuttal of Reaganism in a sense. So, does that remind you that films need to be or intertextual films, when we talk about intertextuality, we are also talking about the socio-political cultural aspects of a particular period. Okay, so, again that takes us back to the original contention that films are not created in a vacuum. Okay. Even a movie like Blade Runner, based on someone else's work, but when it is adapted for the screen, the screenwriter has some kind of a context, okay, the, he has some kind of a vision and what kind of socio-economic, political, historical sit context he wants to situate the film in. So, therefore, intertextuality, if you know the Reagan period and if you know the excesses of the Reagan period, you will be able to relate in a better way to the film, that is the idea. If you do not know anything about it, then much will be lost on you. Okay, so, we will meet again on Monday, having watched Blade Runner. Thank you.